Sometimes we just wonder, what's God doing? What is he doing? And we never know what he's doing. He, he doesn't reveal everything. Sometimes he tells us what he's going to do. And we know things that he has done. But we're not going to know everything. We're really not. There were three friends stranded on a desert island, deserted island, and they found a magic lamp, and they rubbed it, and the genie, genie came out, and the genie agreed to give each one of them one wish. So the first one says, I just want to go home. The genie grants her wish. Poof, she was back home. The second one says, I want to go home too. The genie grants her wish. The third one says, I'm lonely. I wish my friends were back here. <laughs> our, own, our own will sometimes isn't the best. <laughs> isn't the best thing. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. Starts out by saying, trust in the Lord. We have to trust him for salvation. That's the first time we ever trust him. For salvation. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's Acts 4 and 12. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And if we trust God for our salvation, which is the greatest miracle we can experience, why is it hard to trust Him for everything else we need in life? God is always with us. He's in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And then it says, with all your heart. When we trust in God, we don't trust partly in something else or at least we shouldn't. We ask God for healing. We trust Him for healing. We go to doctors. We trust that God uses the medicine to heal us. We don't tell anyone not to go to doctors. We don't tell people to do that. God uses doctors. All good things come from God. So if you have a medical procedure or you're on a medication and it's helping you, that comes from God. Connie got cancer. We prayed. She had surgery. We prayed. She had chemo. We prayed. God healed her when he took her home. God healed her. She didn't take cancer with her into heaven. And now she doesn't have cancer. We have to trust God that he's going to do it, but he does it his way and in his time, and sometimes that's hard because we want to see him do things the way we think he should. Put all your trust in the healer. It's his business how he does it, and when he does it, he's God. Trust him with all your heart. And then it says, lean not unto your own understanding. We don't know what God is doing. Sometimes he reveals what he's doing or what he's going to do. But in our own understanding, we wouldn't get saved because salvation doesn't make sense. It's a miracle. It's not logical that God would come to earth in the form of, in the form of God's Son, allow himself to be rejected, tormented, tortured, abused, and hung on a cross. And he would do that to pay the penalty for our sins. That, has, that makes no sense whatsoever. We take it by faith. Aren't you glad it's true? But if we were just to, to rely on our own sense about it, we wouldn't get saved because it doesn't make sense. Mostly we don't know what God is doing. We believe he has everything under control. But when we see things that are going on around the world, it causes us to wonder what 
is God doing? Well, he knows what he's doing. This thing that's going on in Israel and Gaza, I don't have to tell you what happened there. Everybody's seen on the news the atrocities. Those people who came out of Gaza, Hamas, and what they did, and what continues to happen now in Gaza, babies murdered, atrocities beyond our understanding. But in our own understanding, we want to see God destroy somebody. We want to see God punish them. But our own understanding is flawed because we're not God. In our own understanding, we want to see Putin and the commie pals destroyed. But our own understanding is flawed. We're not God. What God wants to do is see them all get saved. Whose understanding was it when the United States expelled the Cherokee Indians from their homeland, their ancestral homeland? Now that's known as the Trail of Tears. Whose understanding was that when U.S. soldiers massacred 300 Indian men, women, and children at Wounded Knee? And I could go on and on. Lean not unto your own understanding. Somebody's own understanding caused those things to happen. Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 2 says, David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. David lean, was leaning on his own understanding when he killed two-thirds of them. Did God tell him to do that? No. That was his own understanding. In the world today, hatred abounds. Satan is the god of this world, and he is the hater-in-chief. He hates everyone. I'd be amazed if he doesn't even hate himself. He's the hater. He especially hates Christian believers. He's our enemy. Who wants him for a friend anyway? He's our enemy. All believers must be careful not to be haters. We see ungodly things happening. Who would ever have thought that we would see the FBI investigating parents because they complained at a school board meeting about something ungodly that's happening in their school? Who would have thought that we would see transgenderism being considered a right thing, and those who criticize the education establishment are branded as wrong. It's upside down. Who would have ever thought that criticizing the gay lifestyle would have you branded as a bigot? Is God a bigot? Was Jesus a bigot? Those are his words. If you preach a sermon against the gay lifestyle in Canada, you'll be in prison, Australia, probably other places. If you preach any sermon in North Korea, they will kill you. Well, we must be careful not to react with hate. It's easy to slip into that. It's easy to slip into hatred for Hamas and those baby killers. It's easy to slip into hatred. We must be careful not to do that. If we do that, we're no better than they are. We're all sinners. Guard your heart, the Bible says. Don't let the hater-in-chief appeal to your instincts that might cause you to be a hater. We have to guard our hearts. Verse 6 says, in all your ways, submit to him. It's not enough just to come to church, pay your tithes, etc. God is interested in every part of your life. Every time you make a decision, God's will must prevail. 
You can't be in a more peaceful state than when you are in God's will. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Scotty, cast all your anxiety on him about this procedure, because he cares for you. Here we have the promise of God's caring. When we try to do things our own way, we face the prospect of having to lift ourselves by our own hand. God's hand is a better lifter than we are. Trust is required because we don't know how and when he will lift us. We have to trust him to do that. Recognize that to submit, you have to give up the need to control your own life and willingly give it over to God. Prayerfully go to God and seek his forgiveness, his wisdom, his guidance, not just once a day, but all day. Seek him first in prayer. Not just when making huge decisions, but submit to God in all decisions. We were at the Walmart store the other day, and uh, we were exiting the store, and there was a lady there. I think she was waiting for a bus, and she had some flowers, black lady. And I said, oh, somebody's going to get some nice flowers. And she said, these are for my mom. She's in the hospital. I said, what happened? Is she going to be okay? And she said she was in an accident, and she hurt her, her chin or her, her jaw and her leg, I guess it was. And I said, can we pray with you? She said, of course. Well, I could have just gone out the door. That would have been my decision. But God says, pray for that woman. So we did. I think she was gratified. Search, thirst after, seek, and be satisfied by his word to store within your heart. Psalm 119, 10 to 11. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Be content with what you have, your life and your family. You are blessed. I know you all. You're blessed. We all have problems. We all have aches and pains and trials. But we're blessed. In 2 Timothy 4.3 For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. A great number of teachers. College campuses, Marxist professors are teaching, or rather indoctrinating, young impressionable minds to their hideous worldview. Alphabet people, you know what I'm talking about, seem to rule. If you're against anything in the alphabet agenda, you're an intolerant bigot. So by their standard, God is a bigot. I'm with him. So I'll be one too. I can remember having a course in anthropology when I was a student in Penn State 100 years ago. Actually, it was probably about 60 years ago maybe 62, something like that. We learned about cultural mores, which is a system of beliefs that governs the behavior of members of a culture. People need to have a set of standards outside of themselves by which they judge their own actions and attitudes. The Judeo-Christian principles are such a standard. Marxism is another standard. In our society, in our culture, 
Judeo-Christian principles. Our country was founded on it. Currently, our mores are based on human whims. We have a sense of right and wrong, but what's wrong? And what's right? Our right and wrong is based on what pleases God and what displeases God. How do we know what pleases God? It's in His Word. Your Word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. His Word is all, my all-sufficient rule for faith and practice. Not a whim that comes along by Karl Marx or somebody else like that. And then it's talking about your path, and he will make your paths straight. My path is not the same as yours, but it leads to the same end. Or at least it should. One path that we're all on is the straight and narrow path. We turned all we turned aside from the broad from the broad way that leads to destruction at the time of salvation. And got on the straight and narrow. It says, few that few there be that find it. You and I are the elite who have found the straight and narrow path. We're the elite that have turned aside from the broad way that leads to destruction because the Holy Spirit in combination with some presentation of his word brought conviction to you and you capitulated and said, yes, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. Those who are not on the straight and narrow are on a death march. Those who are moving through life by making all their own decisions based on whatever suits them are on a death march. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Death march. Talking about the second death. Talking about Revelations 21, 6 to 8. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Verse 7, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then it says that he will make your paths straight. So we need to be on a straight path to God. If a, if a path or a way or a road is crooked, it takes longer to get to the destination because it's going on a roundabout, meandering way. The enemy doesn't want us to have an easy route to God, and he tries to get us off the path. Let me use my... Security in God's path, the path of life, Psalm 16, verse 11 verses, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones, in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you are, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will, let your faith, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You will, make, you will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, 
with eternal pleasures at your right hand. These are really strange times that we live in. Everything seems upside down. Our traditional righteousness is thought to be bad. The devil's lies are thought to be right. Marxism's on the rise in colleges and even down into our schools. Marxism hates God. Marxism hates the nuclear family. Marxism hates religion. Marxism wants to be the religion. People think they have a right to steal from the stores with impunity at the atrocities in Israel. Don't you wonder, where's God? Do you wonder, what's God doing? But God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God sees things that I don't see. God knows things that we don't know and that we don't see. God isn't dead. God isn't asleep. God isn't on vacation. He knows what he's doing. He withholds his hand when we think he should strike. But that's our thinking. We trust God, knowing his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Then we should just trust him. Here's what we should do. First of all, be humble. Ephesians 4 and 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Second, don't get ahead of God. <laughs> That's something we, we can easily do that. 1 Corinthians 4 or 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Number three, don't argue with God. <laughs> Have you ever done that? I've done that. James 4, 14 and 15. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Fourth, realize God has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody knows that one. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Fifthly, be willing to say that you don't know what God is doing. John 13, 7, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. We don't have to understand right now. In conclusion, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we, will see, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. Whether this is a reference to a mirror or to a glass, the meaning's the same. In uh, the King James, it says we see through a glass darkly. And I looked in the, because most of the translations I consulted said, a, it calls it a mirror. But I looked in the Greek and it says through a glass. I looked it up in the Greek because if I don't know, I look it up. It's not hard to do. Through a glass. But there are contextual reasons why some translate that as a mirror. But it doesn't matter because if it's a mirror or a glass, the meaning is the same. We don't see everything that's going on. We don't see clearly If you look at yourself in a mirror, the impression you have 
of what you look like is backwards. Did you know that? What people see is not what you see in the mirror. <laughs> your parts on the other side, your freckles on the other side. It's not what you see in the mirror is not. We were we were in the business of photography, made up my living that way for 45 years. Every once in a while, somebody'd say, uh, delivering the picture that well, that doesn't look like me. I'd say, well, what you look in, a, what you see in the mirror isn't what looks like you to everybody else. This picture is. <laughs> and I remember when we were in, in, when I was in photography school in California, they had us photograph a model. And then uh, we made two prints, black and white prints of that. She was facing straight forward. And then we cut those two prints in half and matched. One, one of the prints we made was the negative upside down. So the two sides we put together were both the same side. And so we had two pictures. They looked like two different people. <laughs> it was two halves of the same person. I remember, uh, I remember a girl that came, well, this picture doesn't look like me. I don't, this, my head doesn't like this over here. And she was all upset because how the picture looked. And I went down to the principal's office and I said, she can have the picture or she can have a refund. I can't do more than that. But, um, so she came in and the principal was there, assistant principal was there, and, uh, and she made her complaint about how the, this form, same of her face right here wasn't really like that. And I said, well, we're all looking at you right now and it is like that. It's just like the picture. <laughs> she didn't like the way she looks. Now, after we went digital, I could have fixed that. I could have changed the shape of her face to suit her. But I couldn't at, at that time. I don't remember what the conclusion was if she kept the picture. I had a refund check. I said, you can have the picture or you can have a refund. More than I can do. But anyway, uh, how did I get onto that? We, we don't see everything that's going on. We don't see clearly. God knows what he's doing. He lets us in on it once in a while. But he's not obligated to. Don't let what you see bother you to hate. Don't let what you see Hamas doing don't hate because that's a sin. Don't fear. Trust God. He's always going to do what's best. You know, we just wonder. What's God doing? Well, you can keep wondering because he doesn't reveal everything he's doing. He lets us in on a little bit of it. But he's God. Psalm 86, I'm concluding with this, 11, and 11 to 13. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. We know and trust and believe that we are on our way to heaven and that we have aches and pains and we, and we trust God to heal us and he absolutely will. But it could be when we cross over. It could be. So, so it was with Connie. He healed her when she passed. She didn't take cancer into heaven with her. I'm not going to take a sore back into heaven with me. Or arthritic fingers, I'm not going to take. I'll have a whole thumb probably. <laughs> we, have a, we have our own will. It's hard to put our own will aside and just trust God. Especially when we see all the ridiculous things we see going on in the world and on our own country. Don't let that push you over into hating because God doesn't want us to hate and that, that's a sin would you stand
Double, double, double.